Hi, my name is Dr. Steve Auerbach. I am a physician here in New York City and a member of the Board of Directors of Physicians for a National Health Program, the doctor's group that is supporting single-payer, expand and improve Medicare for all nationwide, and also an activist with the Campaign for New York Health, which is promoting the New York Health Act, a single bill, single payer bill for New York State. This is part one of a two-part series. Part one will be focusing on the basics in general of what is meant by expand and improve Medicare for all, also known as single payer or national health insurance. There is also a part two that focuses on the issues of racial uh, disparities and the COVID pandemic. So our current healthcare system, as you can see here, is just a confusing, inefficient, bureaucratic nightmare and mess. Um, it's a multi-payer, fragmented system with different people's eligibility being different at different times, going on and off, different types of uh, insurance coverage or having no insurance coverage, having to pay a lot of money in premiums and co-pays and deductibles and still paying lots of money in taxes and still having much difficulty in getting access to care. So let's take a step back and think at the most abstract theoretical economic uh, basis. What is the purpose of insurance? What is an insurance pool for? The whole purpose of having insurance is to spread the risk. The point is that whether it's healthcare or a fire in your uh, house, household, or maybe you smash up your car, um, at the point when you need it, whatever it is that you need, it's too expensive at that one lump sum point of time. But what makes it more affordable is that if lots of people are paying into the pool and they're doing so regularly every month, month in, month out, whether they as a single individual need it at any single point of time. Hence, spread the risk. So if you think of it that way, then you quickly realize that the most natural and efficient pool for all of the U.S. is all of the U.S., everybody in and nobody out. Now, let's contrast that for a moment with what the actual business is of for-profit corporate health insurance. Their actual business is to create and build up an investment pool for Wall Street. Healthcare is, as the marketing people would say, a loss leader. And in fact, they refer to healthcare as medical loss ratio. That's the money they don't want to pay out because then it's lost to them for their real purpose, which is to be a for-profit investment pool for Wall Street, to say nothing of their own high salaries if you're one of the executives. So let's talk about the completely uninsured for a moment. Uh, in the United States, before the Affordable Care Act, so-called Obamacare, uh, we had over 50 million persons uninsured at the peak of the uh, Great Recession um, in the early 2000s. Uh, around 2006, 2007, uh, 2008. And uh, with the Affordable Care Act, we cut that in about half. Uh, so we went from somewhere, uh, say, the over 50 million to somewhere in the 25 to 27 million range. So we certainly argued in 2017 that it was immoral for the Republicans to repeal Obamacare and throw 25 million people off of their newly acquired health insurance. But we would also argue to the more corporate-minded Democrats that it is equally immoral to still be leaving 25 million people still uninsured, despite the Affordable Care Act. So what is to be done? Well, first of all, there is a misunderstanding out there that most of the remaining uninsured are uh, ineligible for assistance due to their immigration status. In fact, nationwide, that only accounts for 16% of the remaining uninsured. Fully a quarter, 25 million of the remaining uninsured are persons who in fact are eligible for subsidies under the Affordable Care Act, but are still not enrolled 
either because they're just finding it too difficult to jump through all of the administrative hoops um, uh, to get signed up, um, and or despite being eligible for subsidies, they it's still too expensive for them, and they are choosing not to, even if they could deal with it. Fully 25% are persons similarly who are actually eligible for current Medicaid in their states, but are not enrolled, again, because of all the hoops and administrative complexity of getting enrolled, um, the churn of being on and off eligibility, uh, and so forth. 15% are not eligible for subsidies because their income's too high and still have not signed up either because they perceive it as being too expensive or again, because they have to take um, uh, active uh, measures to get enrolled and the paperwork is just so complex, they haven't been able to deal with it. 9% are ineligible for subsidies because they're at least offered coverage through their employer but the amount that they have to pay, um, despite such eligibility out of their own pockets, uh, is still too high and they're choosing not to have it. 9% are ineligible for Medicaid uh, in their particular state due to their particular state not having expanded under the Affordable Care Act. And yes, 16% are ineligible currently due to their immigration status. And certainly we would argue that everybody living in America, regardless of status, should be covered. Um, but in addition to just the O oh, uninsured completely, those persons who are nominally insured still face great economic barriers. Uh, we see here that the rise of inflation, the dark blue at the bottom, um, is much less than uh, the rise in the cost of premiums for family health care shown in the orange. And even worse, even higher than that, is uh, the rapidly increasing cost of the worker's contribution to paying the premium. Remembering that the employer pays some of it, but the amount that the employer pays has been as a percentage less and less over time. So the cost to the workers keeps going up, 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 much faster than inflation and much faster than their wages uh, as shown in the lighter blue below. Indeed, despite the Affordable Care Act and despite the claims that the private sector is somehow more efficient, in fact, when it comes to health insurance, the private insurance is inherently and much, much less efficient in controlling costs than either Medicare or Medicaid, as shown by the diverging line where the cost for private insurance is accelerating much faster than Medicare or Medicaid. In addition, the whole idea of underinsurance, persons who have insurance, but the costs are still too high because of the cost of the premiums to pay for having the insurance. And then if they do get sick, the cost of the deductibles, the cost of all the co-pays, and all of the uncovered expenses out of network, out of pocket, and surprise bills is too much. Using the same um, objective quantitative measure for underinsurance, the survey by the mainstream group, the Commonwealth Fund, shows that underinsurance uh, in the 18 to 64 year old group, 19 to 64 year old group, in other words, adults who are not eligible yet for Medicare. Uh, basically college and working age folks, um, has more than doubled since 2003. So healthcare costs are too high, even if you have insurance. We know that healthcare costs are the leading cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States. So-called medical bankruptcy does not exist in the other Western developed industrialized capitalist democracies, only in the United States. 67% of those filing for personal bankruptcy attributed healthcare costs as the major factor, uh, either directly from the medical bills or the fact that when they got sick, they then lost their work, which meant they lost their employer-based health insurance and then filed for personal bankruptcy. Remember, not only are two thirds of the bankruptcies attributed to healthcare costs, but over three quarters, 78% of those who filed for personal bankruptcy had health insurance when they became ill, 78% of the two thirds. 
So clearly having health insurance just in and of itself is not enough in the United States where the health insurance schemes are just inherently broken. 57% of people who lost their homes due to foreclosure identified medical debt as a major cause. Medical bills are the most common reason for collection calls at 59% with all other call, uh, call reasons for collection calls uh, being only 41%. And it was the only category to not vary by income. Obviously, poorer folks are more likely to have uh, unpaid bills for utilities and rent and things like that, causing collection calls. Uh, but for healthcare, it was spread out much more by all income groups. And quite infamously, medical bills are the most common reason for personal GoFundMe campaigns. So to summarize, the problem of underinsurance is, if anything, far worse than uh, the problem of complete uninsurance. Uh, we like to say that private health insurance is like a hospital gown. The chances are your ass isn't covered between the high co-pays, high deductibles, out of network, unreimbursed out of pocket, ever increasing just monthly premiums. The system is just broken. There would be big savings from single payer. Private insurance overhead far exceeds that of the public Medicare and Medicaid programs. Uh, 2% for Medicare compared to, on average, over 15% for private health insurance. Remember, that additional overhead is all of the paperwork and marketing and CEO salaries and uh, satisfying Wall Street. Insurance overhead is far higher in the United States because of uh, our private fragmented multi-payer for-profit system than in as it is in the other Western developed countries shown here. And our administrative overhead um, in the United States uniquely uh, shown in this growth chart, we have far more healthcare managers and far larger growth in healthcare managers managing physicians, but not actually providing care uh, over the last uh, 35, 40 years. Um, just additional layers and layers and layers of administrative overhead from the insurance companies, managed care organizations, et cetera, et cetera. We spend more on drugs, double the OECD average, uh, one and a half to four times the price for any given drug. Um, remember, these are the same drugs from the same multinational companies uh, that are selling in Canada and Germany and France, etc. cetera. Um, and again, we're paying on average twice the total cost uh, per capita as the other Western developed countries. Drug companies like to claim that they need all that extra money for research. In fact, uh, research is a small piece of the pie of what they spend on. What they call research and development, of course, includes a lot of things that you and I wouldn't really call research in terms of that development wing um, uh, for um, bringing a, a product to market. Uh, and in fact, most basic science research in the United States is publicly funded through your tax dollars going to the NIH and then out to research labs around the country that then turns the uh, discovers new uh, drugs at the most basic level. Um, but the drug companies still get to patent it. So in effect, we've paid twice, once for the basic science research through NIH, and then again in uh, providing them with the government, um, police, uh, court uh, enforced patents. Uh, in fact, they spend much more on marketing, administration, manufacturing, and of course, profits. The United States, as we've said, is um, paying far more for drug prices. But in fact, when the drug companies are selling uh, their drugs to France and Canada and New Zealand and Australia and Taiwan and Japan and Germany, etc., they're still making a profit in those other countries. They wouldn't be selling it if they weren't making a profit. But they charge us much more. And we see this here that pharma has a higher return on revenues than is the case for the average Fortune 500 country uh, company, suggesting that there's plenty of room to fairly negotiate the prices downward. One of the reasons that our unit costs are much higher in the U.S. is that we are, in effect, subsidizing pharma's excess profits. Every other country, Western developed democracy, capitalist democracy, 
all of them cover their residents and spends half of what we do, and many of them with no or minimal cost sharing. Not only are we spending more, but we're spending an increasing percentage compared to the other countries. As you see, the brown line representing the United States diverging from other countries in the Western capitalist developed world. Here's a case of a natural experiment, if you will. Canada implemented their version of single payer across all of their provinces um, uh, nationally by uh, early 1970s. A year or two later, uh, under Richard Nixon, we passed uh, the HMO Act, which began uh, the course of our um, for-profit delivery of health care and uh, increasing layers of bureaucracy and administration and so-called managed care um, on top of uh, uh, the physicians and doctors and clinics as the added bureaucracy. Um, basically, the beginning of neoliberal reforms, if you will. Um, and we show here that unlike uh, the United States, where costs, total system costs have continued to rapidly increase, in Canada, they covered everybody and flattened the curve of total cost increase. Now, those higher costs and more rapidly accelerating increase in costs in the United States are not due to other countries rationing care. In fact, we provide less care as measured here as hospital days per capita than other countries. And we provide less care in terms of outpatient doctor visits than other countries. So it is not a case of rationing. Those other countries are also providing more care. It's just that our care is so much more expensive at the unit cost level. So again, summarizing, we're paying twice the drug price, 10 times the cost for procedures and lab tests. Insurance premiums are rising much faster than general inflation or wages. And we have this super high, much higher than other countries, administrative overhead costs. In fact, the United States is often measured as the lowest performing healthcare system in the Western developed world uh, by multiple studies over the years comparing us to peer countries. This chart shows uh, age group specific mortality rates of 17 peer countries. So the United States compared to uh, other Western developed capitalist democracies uh, all of Europe, but also Japan, um, and so forth. Um, and what we see here is the United States is uh, 17th uh, out of 17, or in some age groups, we managed to get up to 16th or 15th uh, in the age group mortality rates were the absolute worst until you get to the 65 year olds. At age 65, Medicare kicks in there is much easier, affordable access to health care through you know, nearly universal health insurance with Medicare. And lo and behold, our age group specific mortality rates, our ranking compared to those other countries, suddenly does a lot better. And in fact, as you get into the older age groups, for the first time, the United States actually is number one, but only after Medicare as is has kicked in. So bringing an expanded and improved Medicare for all really would improve the health of persons in America. Um, it would be simpler. Uh, it would be more progressively paid for than the flat tax currently of premiums, co-pays, and deductibles being paid for by progressive taxation. It makes economic sense. We've got multiple academic studies showing that uh, funding full coverage through single payer would reduce total system costs. Uh, we have hundreds of e economists who've endorsed it. We're, just to show again where those savings come from, uh, this shows for the New York Health Act. In the red is where there would be the savings reduced costs in New York State through uh, reduced insurance administration of costs, reduced uh, MD and hospital administrative costs and reduce drug pricing and drug devices by um, single-payer um, monospony negotiating for lower costs.
there would be, of course, an increased cost because we're now covering everybody. And we've eliminated the cost sharing of premiums, co-pays, and deductibles and other out-of-pocket costs. We actually increased the provider fees for primary care clinicians who are currently arguably underpaid, as well as adding comprehensive long-term care, which doesn't exist at all in the current system. Nevertheless, balancing out uh, the RAND Corporation's analysis, a center-right group, if anything, uh, shows that there would be, in the New York Health Act, a net savings of 3.6%. Because it's paid for by progressive taxes instead of the flat tax of premiums, co-pays, and deductibles, roughly 95% of persons would, in fact, pay less, and only the top 5% or so would be paying more. And, of course, the whole point of progressive taxes is higher income can afford it. Just to show you an example of what the monthly premiums would be, and you can ask uh, your older friends uh, how much they're paying for themselves and their families. Um, you can see here that for somebody whose income is $50,000, the monthly premium would be $188. Uh, if uh, the split is 38 and 150 between the employer employee, or $188 if you're self-employed. Um, Obviously, if you're, you know, unemployed completely, you're not paying anything. Low income under 25000 don't pay anything. Uh, and only the highest income groups would they be paying more, as much as $4,500 a month for those earning $400,000 or more. One of the important things to think about with single payer, expanded and improved Medicare for all, is we are not talking about just taking current Medicare as it is and saying now you're eligible down to age zero. We are adding greatly additional benefits, and we are eliminating all of those out-of-pocket point-of-service costs, the premiums, the deductibles, and the co-pays. So compared to Medicare, single-payer gets rid of all of those additional costs. The average Medicare recipient, in fact, is spending $6,100 above and beyond for their premiums, their Medigap coverage, deductibles, and co-pays, and that on average is 22% of their income, even while they're on Medicare. Plus, we're covering dental, hearing, and vision care, which is not covered under Medicare, and we're covering long-term care, which is not covered under Medicare, and with our aging population, is an increasing stressor on the whole system and increasingly needed for families and their loved ones. There is rising political support for single payer. This poll shows uh, general polling over time by a uh, mainstream uh, media company, um, going from 40% to 60%. Uh, this particular poll shows, again, roughly 60%. It's a different uh, polling organization, again, mainstream media. Not only is it 60% overall, but as recently as 2017, it was nearly 50-50 split amongst Republicans, an even split with the remainder being undecided. Um, so very high amongst Democrats, very high amongst independents, and even a 50-50 split amongst Republicans. Most physicians now are in favor of Medicare for All. Uh, Merritt Hawkins, a uh, HR firm, um, uh, has done serial surveys and shown between 2008 and 2017. Support amongst physicians has gone from 42% to 56%. So in summary, um, we can do better than we are doing currently. Uh, we have the international comparisons. We have the uh, econometric analyses and the health service system analyses. Um, but we need to basically think from a moral perspective. Is access to health care a private for-profit commodity to be purchased like any other widget? Or is it a social need and a communal good? And we often like to make the comparison to the fire department where um, if your house catches on fire, the fire department comes, they put out the fire. There's no premiums to be paid, just your taxes. There's no co-pays or deductibles. You don't have to pay off the firemen when they arrive before they'll put out the fire. Incentives with the for-profit private insurance are inherently perverse. They inherently have the incentive to avoid covering sick people and then pay for the least care possible. It cannot be fixed. Single payer has been proven to uh, cover everybody, reduce total system costs, reduce costs to individual families and businesses. I point out that Taiwan 
quite recently switched from the system that we have with fragmented private for-profit insurance to a national health insurance system, and it is wildly popular there. Um, so the cure, if you will, is single payer. The national bills is the Sanders bill, um, Senate uh, bill 1129, and the Jayapal bill, HR 1384. And here in New York, we have state-based single payer from in the assembly, uh, from Dick Gottfried in the Senate, Gustavo, Senator Gustavo Rivera, the prime sponsors. It is passed in the assembly multiple years in a row by large margins. And there's only one Senate or uh, shy of a majority of co-sponsors uh, having a majority of co-sponsors in the Senate. Um, again, not just expansion of current Medicare as it is, but massively expanded benefits and improved benefits. More comprehensive benefits than any current private coverage. All medical, mental, dental, hearing, vision, drugs, devices, and long-term care. No premiums, co-pays, deductibles, covers everything, no surprise bills. True freedom of choice where all the doctors and hospitals and other healthcare providers and pharmacies take it, and they are all competing to take you as a patient because that's how they get paid. So everybody has the same insurance and all the doctors and hospitals take it. Security, you always just have it. You own it forever, regardless of changes in employment status or any other changes in your life circumstances. So single payer, it's just better. I would like to offer the following uh, links if you're interested in following up. PNHP.org is a national organization with lots of the technical information. PNHP NY Metro is uh, the New York Metro chapter. Uh, the New York Health Campaign is where you go to fight for the New York State um, Health Act uh, for single payer here in the United in New York. Uh, there are other organizations. Um, you know, I highly recommend everybody get do the free download if you're interested uh, from Public Citizen, the case for Medicare for all at the link shown here at the bottom. Thank you.